All right, hello again, YouTube. My name is Alan. It's always Alan. I don't know why I keep saying that at the beginning of every video, but uh, my name is Alan, and it's that time again. Let's go ahead and talk some metal. Tonight, I'm going to talk about a new wave of British heavy metal band, and the band I've chosen for tonight's topic is Witchfind. Now, right off the bat, if you're not very familiar with new wave of British heavy metal, let me clear something up. Uh, this is not the same band as Witchfinder General. Witchfind was a completely different unit, had a different sound. Uh, the names, yes, are a little bit confusingly similar, but not the same thing. Uh, I've already done a Witchfinder general video that you can check out if you'd like to. So tonight it's Witchfind's turn. And the reason I decided to do a Witchfind vi uh, video was based on a conversation recently had on one of the streams with Marty from the Marty Worm channel. He mentioned that somebody had sent him a copy of a best of which find anthology and he had checked it out and felt like it was kind of well you know mediocre at best and i was you know interested it's like huh i wonder what's on that particular anthology so i looked up the track list and i thought to myself yeah that's not exactly the best of which find on this best of which find so i just thought uh, the band deserves a little better representation than that. Why don't I do a video about them? So we will go through their discography, point out some highlights and some lowlights. Uh, Which finds catalog is a bit inconsistent. It changed some over time. So there are some great tunes that they put out, but there are also some pretty bad misses here and there. There's a few little inconsistent problems that did dog them throughout their career. Um, Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So the band released their first album in 1980, and it's this one called Give Em Hell. And right away, it's a very eye-catching sleeve, nice graphics, it's got, you know, cool sounding spooky name, cool sounding spooky title, great cover art. Um, whoever did the packaging for this really knew how to market the album to you know, this you know, rapidly expanding wave of British heavy metal bands at the time. So yeah, the album went over quite well. The band was picked up and this was put out through Rondelette Records, which didn't do a lot of metal releases. They also did the first Gaskin album, uh, End of the World, which is a great new wave of British heavy metal album itself. But yeah, I think Rondelette was more known for punk bands, maybe? I'm not 100% sure about that. But anyway, they found themselves with you know, a very strong selling record in this first Witchfind album. Now, yes, visually this has a lot going for it. When you get into the music, it's a, kind of a spotty affair in my opinion. And we'll take a run through the track list. The issue with Witchfind on this album is their sound is still very rooted in sort of the longer, slower 70s rock style tracks. So here is the band in all their back cover glory. And let's take a quick look at our track list here. Uh, side one starts with Ready to Roll, which is kind of a mid-tempo, pacey song. It doesn't exactly give the impression that the band is actually ready to get rolling here. It's a little bit of a slow starter. And that's something that would kind of be an issue with all the band's albums. The first song on side eight always was a little bit slow out of the gate. They never did really have that big, strong opener to really kind of wow you with the first thing when the needle hit the vinyl. Uh, track two, The Divine Victim, kind of follows suit. It's a song about Joan of Arc and still is in that kind of, you know, 70s rock operation mode. Uh, the third song, Leave It Nadir, is kind of another long one and duller than the first two. Very strangely, it was the song chosen by Metal Blade Records to include on the 79 Revisited compilation that they put out to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the new wave of British heavy metal. And I have never understood why they picked that particular Witchfind song to put on that compilation. Most of the tracks they selected by the bands included on that are really strong numbers that really will get you excited and interested in the genre. 
And then you have this like seven minute long track called Leaving Nadir, which just kind of drags on and on and is a little bit lifeless. So it definitely wasn't a great representation for the band. Uh, side A wraps up with Getting Heavy, which is a little bit of a goofy number. It's a little more lively at least, but again, it's not going to blow your socks off. So you got to get to side two. And when you get to the eponymous track, Give Them Hell, then you've got a real winner. Uh, that is very much a fists in the air, sing along, really get the blood pumping and the heads banging kind of number. Great tune. But the other two on side two, Unto the Ages of Ages, um, goes back to kind of you know, the slower, mid-paced 70s rock mode. And Pay Now, Love Later is a little more upbeat. A you know, little song about the red light district to wrap it up. So there's not a lot here to hang your hat on. Uh, I've often suspected that if this album had been, you know, packaged differently, let's say they had called themselves, you know, the, you know, T Timothy Duncan band, and the album was called Let's Rock, and it was just like a band picture on the cover, that it probably would not have done nearly as well. Um, I just feel like musically, this one doesn't hold up as well as you'd hope it would, given, you know, the promising graphics you have here. So yeah, if you're hearing a lot of that kind of material from which find, I can see where a lot of folks wouldn't be too keen on the band. But again, it reportedly did pretty well at the time, well enough that Rondelet got the band rushed back into the studio and they actually got their second LP out in 1980 as well. So the sophomore effort was called Stage Fright. It's in this kind of uh, catching yellow and black cover. The Covers on this are kind of textured. It's like a black vinyl cover to it. So again, another album out. You even got kind of your know, custom design for the labels on it there. And this one shows the band improving maybe a little bit, but overall they're still in the same mode. And um, personally, it's probably my least favorite of their four albums. Not a lot of effort put into the back cover graphics on this one. And let's take a quick look at the track list here. It once again gets off to a little bit of a slow start with a stage fright. It's not a bad song, but it's not a real pounder either. Uh, it's okay as an opener. You have Doing the Right Thing, which your band's called Witchfind. You're kind of marketing yourself as this, you know, dabbling in the occult, spooky, dark stuff. And the second song is going to be called Doing the Right Thing. What is this? Reading Rainbow or something? I feel like I'm watching a bad after school special all of a sudden. Uh, not, not a great song here. It doesn't really fit the overall ethos we're going for. Uh, third, Would Not Be Seen Dead in Heaven. Now, there's a song title that fits the aura that you're trying to cultivate. But... Again, it just feels too much like a 70s hard rock song. It's almost got a little bit of a bouncy, dippy catchiness to it. It just doesn't quite work for me. So once again, you got to get to the end of side A, start of side B before things really start to work out. Uh, side A wraps up with Wake Up Screaming, which is now a much faster, more you know, focused, ferocious sounding track. I like that one. Uh, side B starts with Big Deal, which is... Yet another one of these, it's kind of a little bit tongue-in-cheek. Uh, the story behind the lyrics on that one are supposedly, yeah, it's about a band, you know, one of the members is late for showing up for a gig, and they're getting stiffed by the guy who owns the pub and all that. And there was sort of, I a, reportedly kind of a slight against one of the members. I guess there were some egos starting to be an issue in the band by this point. When you get past that, you get to one of the band's best tracks ever with Moon Magic. Really cool, very strong number there. In the Stars is okay, but you lose that edge. You're kind of just back into 70s rock mode here. Uh, Trick or Treat is a better one. I like that. It's been featured in one of my videos before. Uh, cool track there. And then it wraps up with a track called Madeline. Um, let's put the record down. Take off the glasses. This is my face. This is my palm. But anytime you have a song named after a girl, it's probably not going to be, you know, the you know, most extreme skull crushing thing ever. It's probably going to be pop fluff. Guess which camp this one falls into? 
if you can't tell by the veins starting to throb on my forehead, not how to end your album. So yeah, stage fright, frustratingly inconsistent. A couple of very good tracks, an amazing tracking Moon Magic, but a lot of misfires along the way. Now, the album did not do as well as its predecessor, and Rondelet eventually dropped the band, so uh, changes had to be made. And one of the changes was replacing their frontman. Steve Bridges was out of the band after this point, and they had a new vocalist by the time they showed up for a BBC session that was recorded in February of 81, or may have been recorded slightly before and got broadcast in February 81. Those BBC sessions, there was always a delay between when they were recorded and when they got put on the air. So uh, one of the two dates is February 13, 81. And the new singer, going by the name Chalky White, gotta love that British sense of humor. Um, they did four good songs, including a new one called Belfast. And that was the song that got included on a compilation album called The Friday Rock Show. The BBC did a couple of new wave of British heavy metal heavy compilations around 1980, 1981, where as the bands would come in and do their session, they'd pull some of you know, the stronger tracks, put them together and put them out on vinyl. I don't have a copy of the Friday Rock Show or you know, I'd show it here, but you know, the Belfast song showed the band moving in a little different direction. Uh, the song was obviously about Belfast and the situation going on with Ireland at the time. So it had you know, more of a political bit, kind of moving away from you know, the uh, you know, spooky occult uh, flavors that they usually dabbled in. Uh, after that, the band wasn't heard from for a little bit. And this is the point in the story where a lot of bands would just disappear into the woodwork. You know, you've had your first album and it did okay. The second album, you hit that sophomore slump. You get on another compilation or demo a couple of tracks. And at that point, most new wave of British heavy metal bands are at the end of the line. But Witchfind actually persevered and got picked back up by another label and got a third album out in 1983. Uh, if I remember right, this is on the kind of short-lived Repulsion record label. I want to double check that here real quick. Expulsion record label. There we go. And the third album was called Cloak and Dagger. It came on both a regular LP and picture disc. This is the picture disc. I'm not sure why I felt it necessary to tell you that. It's been a long day. I'm running on Red Bull and Red Bull. Uh, this album shows the band finally starting to move away from that, you know, a little too slow for its own good rock vibe and focusing on a more forceful sound. And again, this is coming out in 1983. Metal's moved forward a lot in the past three years, and Witchfind is now kind of catching up with that. Uh, this one, again, is a little inconsistent, though. It has some of my favorite Witchfind songs on it. It also has a couple of real stinkers. So let's take a look at what we've got here. Starts off with The Devil's Playground, which, promising title, fits their whole, you know, occult thing. Not a good song, kind of a flat. Uh, Crystal Gazing is after that, and again, come on guys, let's get things in gear here. But track three, it clicks, and it clicks really well with I'd Rather Go Wild, which is a real screamer of a track, very anthemic. Uh, that's the kind of song that should have been on the 79 Revisited compilation, for sure. Uh, after that, you also have the excellent Somewhere to Hide, which has a really big chorus, very catchy. It'll get stuck in your head right away and stay there for a long time. And Side A wraps up with Cloak and Dagger, which is a little slower, more pounding number. Definitely the kind of song where everybody's meant to have their lighters up in the air and banging their heads slowly and chanting the chorus along with them. So yeah, once you get past those first two numbers, Side A is very, very strong on this. Side two starts with a pretty fast one called Cry Wolf. Uh, then it goes into Start Counting, which just sucks the energy right back out of things. The, the only thing you count during this song is how long it's going to take to end. But they pick it back up with the third track. Living for Memories is another one that's similar to Somewhere to Hide on Side A, where it's got a very recognizable chorus, a good hook. It will stick with you right away. It makes a very strong impression. Really like the tune. Then it ends on a little weaker material with Rock and Roll, 
let's face it, anytime a metal band does a song called Rock and Roll, unless that band's leader is Lemmy, that is not going to be a great song. Uh, and then you have Stay Away Fra Diablo wrapping up the album. So it starts a little weak and it ends a little weak, but everything through the middle of the album is actually uh, pretty good. Um, now this features the same vocalist that had been on the BBC session, but he had stopped going by Chalky White, good call, and instead was going under the name Luther Bells, which still a little tongue in cheek there probably, but uh, it's still a step in the right direction. And Luther is definitely an acolyte of the King Diamond school of vocals. Um, his style, now obviously he's not as good as King Diamond. Nobody really sounds as good as King in that particular style. But uh, Luther does an okay job there. Uh, it gives the songs more of a distinct sound to them. And again, the album just overall, even though it's got a few misfires, it feels a little more focused. It feels like the band's got a more solid metal direction here. So... Uh, it's not the best new wave of British heavy metal album ever. It's not going to redefine anyone's life, but it is a good album. I do recommend checking that one out for some of the band's better material. All right, Expulsion didn't last very long as a record label. So uh, again, by this point, most new wave of British heavy metal bands would call it a day, but which find had one more trick up their sleeve. They got picked up by Mausoleum Records. Now, Mausoleum... I've always gotten the sense that back in the day, Mausoleum didn't have the best reputation as a label, that they were one of those labels that kind of picked up a lot of the bands that had already gotten past their prime, or and they were picking up you know the second or third tier bands that you know, weren't going to ever get a whiff from a bigger label. Uh, over time, though, I think folks have come to appreciate more of the Mausoleum roster than they did back at that time. It may have just been that Mausoleum was a little later to the game and was getting stuff, you know, signed on like around 84 and such, which it was getting definitely into the later phases of New Wave of British Heavy Metal. But anyway, Witch Fun did end up uh, releasing their fourth and last original album on Mausoleum in 84 called Lords of Sin. So kind of going with the occult thing once again there. It's their thing. It's what they do. No problem with that. And this one's actually a fairly nice package. It was released as a gatefold. So let's check out the inside. The picture on the inside is a little reminiscent to me of uh, Requiem's Via Crucis out of Italy, which would come out you know, several years later. I don't know if Requiem kind of borrowed the idea for the graphic or not. It's cool to think they did. Uh, and this one came with a bonus 12 inch live EP. So you, know, you got some extra music as well. Uh, this one kind of picks up where Cloak and Dagger left off. So again, much more consistent than the earlier stuff, more medley. Take a quick look at the track list here. Uh, side one, once again, doesn't have the best opener. Lords of Sin is all right, but it's just a little slow feeling. It doesn't quite have that energy or spark to it. Uh, but after that, you have the excellent Stab in the Back, one of the band's best songs. Once again, this is the kind of track that should be featured on compilations like 79 Revisited. Heartbeat is a slower song, but it's got a very good atmosphere to it. It works very nicely, establishing this kind of cool, creepy, uh, dark, almost slightly gothic kind of vibe to it. Really like the track. Uh, side A wraps up with... Uh, let's see. Yeah, Scarlet Lady, which is a faster one and works okay. Once again, kind of going back to the idea of the you know, red light district for inspiration. Side two has Blue Devils. Uh, it's kind of an average track, doesn't stand out. You have Hall of Mirrors is another very good atmospheric one, that little dark vibe to it. Wall of Death isn't bad, like that one. Uh, Conspiracy is another one of these that's meant to you know, get the lighters up, get the whole audience chanting along. Really cool track. And then it wraps up with a kind of a silly little outro-y thing called Red Garters, where they literally, I think, start at some point by saying, I like Red Garters. Gotta love that British sense of humor. So yeah, it feels like it's kind of a short album, but it's a pretty good one. Uh, right there, of the two, I usually say this is my favorite over Cloak and Dagger, but it's close. If you like one, you're probably going to like the other. 
The live EP has four really good cuts on it and shows the band to be in really fine form. Uh, it features versions of Cloak and Dagger, I'd Rather Go Wild, Moon Magic, and Give Em Hell. So it's kind of nice that it spans you know, all the band's albums and shows that even some of those early songs still sound really good when performed live, that even those first two albums did have some really solid tracks on them for sure. All right, that would, however, be the end of the line for Witchfind. After that, there were no more takers, and the band kind of faded into the woodwork. Now, long after the fact, the band would sort of uh, get back together. i got to check the date on this. I'm not familiar with the later material. They had that Best of Witchfind compilation came out in 96, got them a little attention, and then they had some full links put out in the early 2000s, one called Witching Hour and one called Play It to Death. I have not heard those, so I cannot comment on them. I do know that there ended up being some ugliness with the members and who had the rights to what. And it became another one of these situations where you had a couple of different units all trying to use the Witch Find moniker at the same time. So if you're looking for Witch Find material from that era, you've got to pay attention to who's in the band and who's not. I don't remember all the incarnations that came along. I think there was one that was something like, you know, Witch Find featuring Luther Belt versus Witch Find versus, and there may have been another iteration mixed in there too. Always kind of annoying when that happens. And we see it happen a little too frequently in heavy metal bands. Uh, you know who I'm talking about. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> Batushka <coughs> and others, but uh, yeah. It, just be aware of it if you're looking at which fine material from the 2000s. It is going to have a different lineup, different original members, different later members, depending on exactly what item you're looking at. All right, so there's the Witch Find discography for you. Uh, now, let's shut this down and let's talk metal in the comments down below. What's your favorite Witch Find album or Witch Find song? Do you prefer the first two albums and the two other two sound just a little too generic to you? Uh, let me know what you think of the band and their music in the comments down below. So that will do it for tonight. Until next time, as usual, everybody uh, stay safe. And as always, keep banging your head. Ooh. Red Bull, folks. Lots and lots of Red Bull tonight. Y'all take care.